first of all, um, thank you for showing up this early in the morning. Um, also, thank you for showing up uh, for us in this moment. Um, I'm excited to be with you all today. My name is Jenny Boyts. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I work in the community development sector during the day and on the weekends and at nighttime and really early coffee meetings. I'm the board president of Indie Pride. Um, and I'm excited to kind of walk you through um, a couple different uh, parts of my life and then starting to weave into um, where we're at right now, both as an organization but also as a city and where you all can really lean in to support. So grateful um, to have this space and this time. I just want to shout out and share um, a bit of gratitude to the Creative Mornings team. I think when they asked me to do this uh, talk last month, um, I had one vision in mind, um, and you know that's evolved in the last uh, 30 days. It's also deeply evolved in the last five days. So I just uh, switched it up, just given the week that we've had, um, and what I feel like is just a real urgency in the moment. And so thank you to Creative Mornings for just being um, flexible and open to, uh, to those ideas and to all the changes that I know I've thrown out. Um, today is uh, Trans Day of Visibility, and I've been thinking this week, yes, shout it out. I've been thinking this week a lot about kind of the, the two sides of vis visibility, right? Like the good side of this, which is like representation, right, all the time. Um, and then I've also been thinking about the vulnerability of visibility, right? Like what does that mean um, to ask folks to be visible and to show up as we hope their most authentic selves? And so I just wanna um, shout out and give the most gratitude uh, today to Sylvia and Jody who have um, both been vulnerable in this space but also I think really brave and courageous and um, are just beautiful humans. And so thank you for being here and at least you know, weaving into this vision that I had. We'll shut you in. Um, one last person who is not here this morning, but you um, either know or you will quickly want to pay attention to is Greg Rose. Um, they also go by the uh, moniker, or Hey Kid. Um, I am wearing a custom shirt, uh, sweatshirt that uh, Greg designed. There are t-shirts and sweatshirts over here. Um, you can take one home today, although there's a very limited number. Uh, or there's an online shop, and so just want to support Greg um, in this moment, but also uh, really one of the projects that we're working on, and we'll, I'll share more about that, is um, a queer artist residency next year and, and with Greg's help. And so, um, shout that out. Uh, and so, not only just I'm really proud and love um, Greg as an artist, but as a human, and um, am grateful for their support as well. Um, so what I often do in these uh, kind of moments or meetings, or if you've ever been in a meeting with me or any kind of courageous conversation or challenging conversation, is trying to kind of bring some, you know, some level setting and grounding. Um, sometimes that's a quote or a poem or something that's resonating with me. And um, I've just been deeply kind of transformed in the last year or so since learning about um, Public Universal Friends. So I'm actually um, going to offer, and I appreciate Jody's willingness to offer a song to bring us into the space. Um, and so I will uh, hand the mic, or Greg will hand the mic, I, or Fred will, because I don't want to touch it, um, to Jody. And then um, we'll come back and then uh, dig in together. So welcome, Jody. <laughs> everyone. My name is Jody Friend. This is about one third of Public Universal Friend. <laughs> we're getting, we're a much larger band than we used to be. Um, I want to say like Trans Day of Visibility, um, very vulnerable time. I have learned over the course of the last couple years of Puff's existence that disclosure is a gift and a privilege. So to be in a place where there is so much love and so much openness and kindness. It's a privilege to share this experience with you. So thank you so much for being safe. Um, so I grew up in East Tennessee, which is fun. Um, they loved me. <laughs> and um, being closeted gay and trans at the same time is, uh, is, a, is a treat. And I think, especially this week, brought that to in my mind and heart in a way that was really painful as like it's a pretty broken place and the south is a culture that was not particularly welcoming to people like me so 
when I wrote this latest album that we released a couple weeks ago called Chrysalis, <laughs> hell yeah, um, <laughs> it, was a, it was out of an effort to embrace um, a southern sound from a trans perspective, which is something that you don't fucking hear, dude. <clears throat> so um, this is a song I wrote about my experience growing up in the church, and it's called Jesus, part one. We have um, a merch table over here if you want to come say half toward. Said I'll see you on Sunday morning You said you'd see me in hell Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference these days I guess it's just as well In that book it is also written What you seek, you shall find Well, maybe hell and heaven aren't places like that Maybe it's all a state of mind Isn't hatred just a sickness Turning back into itself He said I am an abomination And I guess I'll see you on hell Grew up thinking there were those people who had all gone off some deep end. By the time it was all so back to me, those people had become my friends. Jesus died with sluts and bastards. Jesus died with houseless thieves. Jesus died with the unwanted. Do you think Jesus died with me? Isn't hatred just an ignorance turning back into itself? They said I am an abomination And I guess I'll see you all in hell Oh, I guess I'll see you all in hell Thank you all so much. Thank you. One more time for Jody, please. <laughs> um, so I hope maybe it resonated, or at least you can start to see a through line when I start to tell my story of what a, both a beautiful story that is in that song, but also um, some of the pain and hurt that I think um, many of us have experienced um, in the church. So um, I'm going to walk you through this kind of story uh, in three different parts. Um, the first one really at the individual level, so kind of telling you a little bit about me, myself, myself um, 
some of my background, uh, and then how that really has started to um, bleed into this institutional um, kind of role or uh, leadership that I'm kind of playing right now, and then really trying to leave you all with an invitation to um, to join us and to start moving forward with us in this in this work. Um, so I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, which also is a fun place uh, <laughs> to grow up. Um, my uh, parents helped start one of the largest, what is now one of the largest uh, Baptist churches in North Texas, and I knew I was gay when I was six years old. Um, that is not the same story uh, as others have around their own coming out, um, and I certainly want to just uh, elevate it right now and in this moment that what I'm about to tell you is one story. Um, there are millions of stories that I hope that you continue to kind of learn and dig into of people either in this room, outside of this room, and around this, um, in this community. But mine is one really unique. So I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, you can laugh at how cute I was or my size of my glasses. Thank you. Uh, thanks. <laughs> um, I played baseball with the boys till they told me I couldn't anymore. Uh, I even apparently when I broke my arm was committed, this committed to the sport. Um, and again, I knew really early on, I had that awareness of my own identity at the age of six years old. Two memories are coming up for me that I want to share with you um, as it relates to that. Uh, and one of those is, um, you can't tell, but there is no ponytail in that hat. I rocked a really nice bowl cut. Um, year over year, uh, and um, was in the bathroom, the girls' bathroom in first grade, um, and can vividly, I don't have, my friends in the room know, I don't have a vivid memory of anything before the age of like 18. Uh, but there's a few things that come up for me, and one of, these, one of them is this, and so I had to have been six years old or so, was in the girls' restroom, a teacher walked in and said, you are in the wrong restroom. Like, this is not where you're supposed to be. We need you to leave right now. Walked me out, walked me down to the principal's office, um, and instead of calling the teacher whose class, even though I was insistent that I was a girl, and this is, you can go ask my teacher, call my mom instead. Uh, similarly, uh, around the same age and around the same time, um, thinking I was maybe like starting to spit some game at the age of six, told Crystal at the water fountain uh, that I thought she was cute. Um, and in the exact same rhythm, that teacher, a teacher pulled me out of line, walked me to the principal's office and called my mom. Um, and so it's, that was my first introduction to shame, right? Like this, this part of myself um, that somebody was saying uh, was wrong. And then you start to believe that, that then you yourself is wrong. Like that's what shame does, right? It starts to say like, you know, this behavior that whether it is wrong or someone's perception of that behavior is wrong is somehow my identity or my personhood. Um, then you start to say, well, then maybe I'm wrong. Like, maybe that is fundamental to me, and that is something that I, I need to kind of push away. Um, and so I did that. You know, so again, I played uh, baseball with the boys till they tell me I couldn't anymore. Um, I, I started to, you know, continue to try to push the line related to gender, um, but certainly wasn't in any place or position to be able to share anything I was thinking about who I thought was cute. Um, or what kind of stories I wanted to hear or listen or read. Um, and so that was really my first introduction to shame, was this just really early age. And what that did for me, I think, um, is, uh, you know, made me realize that there just maybe wasn't space for me, maybe in my family, um, or the traditional kind of rigid definition of family that I grew up with, like there just really wasn't space for me there. There certainly wasn't space for me in this kind of definition of romantic love. Um, and so what I did was uh, just started making my own friends. Um, I started building my own community. I started connecting people in the ways um, that I hoped or wished that someone was connecting me. And I did that so young, right? I still do that. Like I still want, uh, and I have a lot of friends, many of you in this room, I was really good at it. Like that was you know, a trauma response that I would actually offer is maybe now one of my strengths is that this idea that I really wanted people to see me and be seen, um, and therefore I just started building community and friends. I was on teams, I was, um, you know, I found my way to build relationships um, in the church, but really wanted to um, build a lot of people around me to help me see, and see myself and to be seen. I still do that, like I, that is still a part of who I am, and, and I'm proud to say one of my biggest strengths. Um, 
But I would offer, again, you know, this idea that, like, that as a trauma response is now something that I'm, I am really proud to do day to day. Um, what I also learned then really, on, really early on was that I um, could not stay in Texas. Uh, I just, I couldn't. And, um, you know, what's, what's, uh, what's true is that um, I, was, I lived in a really safe, physically safe home, but I was absolutely not emotionally safe, and I absolutely wasn't psychologically safe, spiritually safe as well, right? Just didn't have those safety mechanisms around me. So I left. Um, I went to a, believe it or not, a teeny tiny little um, private co Mennonite college in Kansas. Um, and the Mennonite, the kinds of Mennonites who are like, no, 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 like we will build community and we will like, we will like root for social justice and we're going to connect people and we're going to do that. And that was the first time in my life I had ever heard anybody talk about the Bible in a non-literal way, which I can remember the moment that happened. And thinking like, oh my God, like this is, it was almost like a door had opened that I didn't have to necessarily step into that door with Christian faith, but I certainly knew that that, that was not the door that I needed to walk through, right? Um, and so that was a really, really formative moment for me, thinking about kind of like who I was, um, what did that look like uh, to be me in a space where people were going to ask questions and get curious, and I didn't have to hide or kind of continue to adopt that shame or you know, embody that shame that I had been feeling. I left Kansas. I came to Indiana. Um, you know, turns out, even though I was like 15 when I started playing softball, I was decent at it. And so they said, come to Indiana um, and play softball, and I did. Um, it was cold as hell here for the first little while, first few games. Uh, but it allowed me to, again, find a freedom and a path to kind of create for myself what was this identity I wanted to live. My first stint in Indiana was about six or seven years. Um, went to undergrad here. Uh, I have a bachelor's in social work, so was working in Hawville for quite a while. Um, helped start a school and got my feet wet in community development at 38th and Keystone, kind of the Meadows area. Um, and felt really, really uh, excited and, and again, kind of um, validated in some ways of this idea that like connecting people could be something that I could do for a living, which was really exciting as well. Um, I built the best friendships, the best community. Folks in the room may remember the 10 or other kind of queer welcoming spaces back then, Talbot Street. Um, that's where I really got to really live into and embody and realize some of these parts of myself that I had always kind of been pushing down. So um, that feels really important to me to highlight here as well. Um, for a lot of reasons, uh, uh, mostly personal, I actually then left Indiana um, and went to Colorado. So like any kind of heartbroken lesbian, I went to Denver, Colorado. <laughs> okay, and then I, uh, you know, like drank beer on patios and like learned to snowboard and stuff. Uh, <laughs> And it was awesome. I also went to grad school, like everyone's from. I went to grad school. Um, it was awesome. Like it was, and I, and I joke, but it truly was this like necessity to push me out of where I was to kind of say like, go find yourself again um, and, and build something new for yourself. And so that, that happened for me in the mountains. But it, what also happened for me in the mountains and in Colorado was, um, you know, we woke up uh, November 9th of 2016, and you may all remember this, um, but you know, we, we woke up and I was a little bit of in shock the morning after the election that Trump had won. Um, and I went to the, like, my local hipster coffee shop, right? And we were all in shock, all crying into our like oat milk vanilla lattes <laughs> shit. Um, and it was in that moment and on that day, when I was flipping through pictures kind of uh, to, to give to Ryan for this, I actually came across a picture that was dated November 9th, 2016. Um, because again, as you do in moments of turmoil, you like design tattoos and you like contemplate where you put them on your body, right? Uh, so, and one of the tattoos that I had at the time really thought I needed or wanted was, um, was the kind of symbol that starts a new paragraph, right? Some people call it like Alenia, like it's like kind of a, a um, and I thought, this is going on my body, because like, right now, today, I got to do something different. I didn't get the tattoo. Um, but, I, but I did actually say, like, oh, no, like, this is a moment. Like, I have to start something new and different for myself. I want to be really clear. Like, there is a lot of privilege that, I, that allowed me to say I am coming back to the Midwest, right? Like, n none the least of which is that, like, my whiteness and the resources I had access to allowed me to say, 
I am going to go back. I am going to like be able to step myself back into a space that is unknown, that might be unsafe, that may be, you know, it's going to be a lot of like heartache. Like that is not the story, and, and this is not a call to action for you all to step into that. This is just my story and what felt like this real urgency to return to the Midwest in that moment. That was early November. I was back in Chicago, so like not really the Midwest, but <laughs> um, I was back in Chicago in, on Jan in January, like mid-January of 2017. Um, it was my bridge back to Indiana, um, but I knew leaving Colorado, and this is like, again, quintessential lesbian. I was really heartbroken. That's my beautiful dog. Like, you get it. Uh, <laughs> you can see it now, right? Um, and there was, uh, but I, I left this behind because I was feeling, personally, me, was feeling like I needed to go back. Like, this is a place I love. Like, people I love. Like, a community I love that loved me when I was still figuring out kind of like who I am and what is my role. Um, and there's something happening there. And I need to, and I need to not pretend um, like my life in the mountains is is all there is, right? Um, and so again, I I was feeling that kind of pull and urgency, and what I would call kind of this moral obligation to return to the Midwest. Um, and I and I don't want to dismiss kind of the privilege that I brought with me, but want to just say that like that is exactly why I am back here right now. Um, is because feeling like these are people, these are communities. This is work that I love. And there is going to be, we all knew this um, in 2017, there is going to be a lot of suffering, a lot of heartache, and a lot of pain. And I am not going to solve that. But what can I do at this kind of community level to start bringing kind of and creating spaces for people to heal and protect folks, right? So I came back to Indiana in um, like late 2018, maybe 2019-ish. Um, and, uh, and, and really kind of said like, okay, part of the transition back means that I want to dig back into, um, into this work at a community level, right? And so uh, 29, is this right? 20, this is when you need a whiteboard for my <laughs> life. Um, it was around 2020. So we all remember where we were kind of summer of 2020. Um, we, were, we were all grieving and um, living in our rage of the murder of George Floyd, more locally, the murder of Dreyjean Reed. Like, we were living in this pain here in the city. Um, and I was also, again, feeling really compelled to, like, dig back in. Like, who am I in this place, in this city? Um, one of my very best friends still, um, Yolanda Hummer Home, shout out Yolanda if you're watching, um, had, you know, called and said, somebody reached out to me to be on the Indie Pride board. I can't do it. I don't have the capacity. But do you want to? And I thought, sure. Like, yeah, like, this is exactly kind of what I've been wanting, what I've been looking for, connection, community. I have no idea, like, you know, what this established organization, long-term organization is doing in the city, but I certainly wanted to find out and figure out if there was a way for me to plug in. Um, and so, you know, spent a lot of 2021 kind of listening and learning. What I also learned in, in those early days is there's a whole lot of really beautiful queer talent and relationships that I was ready to invest in here in this city. Um, I was uh, introduced to Sylvia, um, I don't actually know when or how, but probably around that time. Um, and just am always inspired by the ways in which she shows up really vulnerably and raw, but also like in the most beautiful, creative, every time you see her perform, it's like a new spin on creativity. Um, so as we transition to kind of this institutional part of the story, I just want to invite Sylvia on to kind of um, to tell us her story and, and through her performance as well. I don't want to touch this. Hear me okay? Cool, loud. Um, I'm so honored. I've always wanted to do uh, a creative morning or be a part of one. So thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I'm so lucky to be here and with community and what you said. Really, truly, I feel that. Um, I think it's Jardy and I were just saying that's the only reason we're here. I think is because of community. I've been lucky to have opportunities 
to perform all over, but um, but uh, yeah, I'm so lucky I get to have all of you. Um, so this piece is the poem that changed my life. It's booked me prides all over the world, um, including World Pride in 2021 in Copenhagen. And so I thought I'd do this one as it's a reflective piece on community and what it means. So it's also my first time using a looper, um, so be patient. <laughs> or using it live. I've been rehearsing, but you know. <laughs> Imagine, I'm like, what is this thing? Um, this is um, back in the closet. I'm gonna like turn away for a moment. I wondered where I went, and I wondered that too. It was supposed to be another night of being hypnotized by beautiful girls and boys and the bodacious thighs while dancing all dumb, doubting danger, dosing drugs, and drinking with strangers. But for the first time in a long time, I had to stay home in Rome, in a place that lived lies and told truths, all to which I can now confront and I cannot control. Instead of collecting, collectively cheering with community, I came back to my closet. I came back to wonder why I wandered away. I came back to think. I thought about touch and what it means in my community to be told we're good enough with just our fingertips. I thought about drag queens demanding democracy, diluting drama, and giving the damned more damage. I thought about trans women. As our death tolls rise like ticks and talks, we take our time and tell our truth. I thought about how bold our bodies were, bumping and booming to each other's feet in a bustling gay bar with sweat and heat, and I felt baptized. I thought about our lovers who leave and live their lives, not promising a tomorrow or next time. I thought about our past, holding our people in poverty and how it is still our present. I thought about lesbians living life loud and loving louder, gay men lusting in a crowd and liberating prouder just to give us each a bit of power. I thought about how black and brown really bond what we know to be a rainbow. I thought about the first time that you and I met and we hosted a hug instead of a handshake because in our heart community, our hearts are not humble neighbors with each other. I thought about my closet and our closets and how we keep our colorful clothes kept away with our courage until that one day you find yourself a key whether that key be a book, a person, a song, an article, or a magazine, one thing is, one day something set us free, free from failure to perform perfectly, because when they only saw wounds of skin, honey, I was born to be burned, and it shows how every day I'm still flaming, <laughs> how my love, my sexuality, my gender, my pride is something I will always be claiming. The night I left my friends, to make amends with the odds and ends. It's just another weekend's cleanse. The first step was to place a mirror in my closet. The last step was to be honest.
editing this book and the looper. Um, <laughs> um, love you so much. Um, so yeah, um, this is Twirl. Um, after performing at World Pride, I was one of the only few US acts at World Pride in 2021 because of COVID. So um, I wrote a collection about my experience, pretty much like about what it means to be a Hoosier and queer and trans. And I brought it to an international audience. And so that, including some other poems, are available in the book. In the chat book, all I, what I have is what I have. Um, I'll have releasing projects later this year, so look out for that. You can follow me on these things. Ooh. And um, yeah, she is Sylvia. Ooh, we're close to the amp. We're close to the amp. She is Sylvia.com. She is Sylvia um, on Instagram. And um, thank you so much for having me, Jenny. I love you so much. Um, also, Trans Glam, um, look out for it. we part of Indie Pride, so yeah, I love you all. Thank you. Um, for as much like religious trauma as I carry, I realize in this moment, I actually, we just like organized church. So <laughs> thank you to Sylvia one last time. Uh, So I, I felt like that was a, um, a good transition to just bring us home, right? Like Sylvia feels like home, but also this is Sylvia's home. And um, Sylvia is uh, such, a, such an important part of our narrative as a, as a city um, and as a queer community. So thank you, Sylvia. Um, and so part of that was kind of this idea of me returning to Indiana, figuring out a way to kind of dig back into community. Um, I joined the board of Indie Pride um, in 2021. So I did the whiteboard thing over there. And it was 2021. And again, we might remember where we were in 2021. Um, we were still like washing our groceries and shit, right? Like we didn't really know. Uh, we absolutely were not like holding big events and we certainly weren't gonna like host a Pride Festival or Pride um, Parade. And so what I knew was that I um, mean, this is, this is kind of my orientation generally, is like, let me just go feel out a room. Let me just listen, let me observe, let me like, so I, I was committed to doing that in that year, in 2021. Um, by the end of 2021, I had listened and observed to, um, to folks trying to really reconcile, like, how do we show up in this moment? Uh, and also, like, personally, how do we continue to show up in this way? Um, and so for lots of reasons, COVID, and the least of which none of it, just COVID and all that did to kind of transform our lives. Um, at the end of 2021, five board members out of 18 remained. Um, and what I think about when I tell this story often is that like, there is no shame or judgment in folks who said, I cannot, I have to step away for whatever that reason is. But it meant then that the five of us had to kind of look around the room and say like, well, then what are we gonna do? Um, and at the end of 2021, I think I had also observed and we were feeling kind of not only this like tension of how do we really honor the good work of the folks who have been doing this for 20 plus years in the city and in the state. Again, many of them years and years ago who were not able to live as out loud, who were losing friends daily to the AIDS epidemic, who were like not just like closeted, right, but also like hidden. And, and how do we honor that and the work and investment and time that those people have given and also start to reckon what was um, a challenging year for the way the organization had been showing up for folks. 
And more specifically for folks of color, of folks of intersectional like sexual orientation, gender identity, like we had to really kind of reconcile and start to reckon like what are some of these things that we wanted the five of us to kind of do going forward. We didn't know what we wanted to do, but we did know that it was two options. We either like keep the pause going. So say like we're just gonna keep, we're gonna keep in 2022, you know, feeling out COVID and see where we're at. Um, or do that and start to plan for some in-person events. Um, and so what that also meant though, that it was the five of us couldn't do that on our own. And so what we did was we um, started uh, the process to recruit more board members. Um, and with a real commitment and intentionality to racial diversity, gender diversity, um, and sexual orientation diversity. And so um, I'm really proud to say that year we, um, we slated 18 of the most racially diverse um, board members and the most gender inclusive board members that this organization had ever seen. Um, we also that year, that's worth celebrating. We also that year um, needed to hire a new executive director. So for the first time in the history of this organization, not only was there the first female board president, there was also the first female executive director. So feeling really proud about that and the introduction of those kind of perspectives. Um, and I think we were all kind of saying like, what are we fighting for in this moment, right? Like, do we either, um, are we fighting for power and privilege, right, like, and, and resources and all the things that we know we have been kind of kept from us as a community, um, or are we actually fighting for, like, shared freedom, right? And, and so this question that I ask myself still and, and, and would venture and ask that you all continue to ask yourselves this is, like, what are we really fighting for? And I think our commitment in 2022 was as a group of decision makers who could plan events, like, we wanted as best we could to be fighting for power and, I mean, no, fighting for, um, fighting for freedom, fighting for inclusivity, fighting for um, kind of creating those kinds of spaces. Um, and so that was really the ethos by which we brought 22 events back in person last year alone. Um, in June, uh, the uh, parade was one of the biggest, how many of you all went to the parade? So you heard me say that we had a lot of new people. We really learned a lot. We had never done this before, so we also could say sorry to a lot of people. If it, if it, was, it was a lot of people in a really tight space. It'll be better. Um, and last year, about 60,000 people at the parade here on Mass Ave, and about 35,000 um, were in the festival grounds. Uh, we scanned 36,000 tickets that day. Um, and so, yes, that's important. Shout out. Um, Shouting that out for a couple of reasons. One, I think like just really proud of um, the group that made a lot of that happen. And also just like this emphasis that like we're here. Like there are queer Hoosiers, not just in this city, but around the state. We organize a group of pride organizers from 40 different cities and counties around the state of Indiana, 40. Like we are everywhere in the smallest counties and to like, to your South Bends, Fort Wayne, Evansville, like we are here and we're everywhere. Like this isn't, we're not a hidden kind of group, right? And so I feel really proud about that. In 2022, we relaunched that group of pride organizers um, and, and continue to, to kind of nurture that. I will say at the end of 2022, um, and then we'll get to the invitation piece here. At the end of 22, I think we were also feeling this, um, this kind of contemplation, like what are we fighting for? Are we fighting for power and privilege? Are we fighting to be able to treat people the way that we've always been treated? Um, or are we actually fighting for like just shared freedom, right? Like this collective idea that we can all be free, you know, that none of us are actually free unless we're all free, right? Um, what that also meant though is that truly none of us could like be alive unless we're all alive. So I shifted a little bit of my thinking on from changing this idea of changing hearts and minds, especially in the state, to just keeping people alive, right? And, and, and that is real and I do not want to gloss over what I just said. Like, this is an organization that's committed to not necessarily changing people's minds, hearts and minds around this idea, and you need to understand me to care about my, like, survival. Um, no, I'm actually just really interested in how do we figure out the spaces to keep people alive, right? So when everybody was kind of like, thoughts and prayers in Colorado Springs, we were literally hosting a gunshot wound training down the street for every queer bar in this city. If you don't know that I, I know exactly where my Stop the Bleed kit is here, I, I do, right? Like that is the truth and the reality of what we are doing and what we want to be doing is creating these safest people, safest spaces psychologically, emotionally, and physically 
um, for queer folks in this state. But it doesn't mean that, that, that like, we don't need folks continuing to think about how to change hearts and minds, right? Um, and so this is really where this invitation kind of comes in. I think this is the next slide, Ryan. <laughs> um, oh, it's this, okay. Um, it's been here for like minutes. Um, so this is where the invitation comes in, right? Is that like there is this, this reality that like social change comes with an ecosystem, right? That there are more than folks who can stand in front and feel confident, but let alone like have the time, emotional energy, and resources to be able to stand in front of a state legislator and plead for people to see us as humans. That's one role, right? Like that's, but we need all kinds of roles in this work, right? Especially in this moment, especially at this kind of point in time. And re realistically, like going forward, so what I would offer is this kind of a framework that I've been really um, wrestling with and, and continue to kind of bring both in the way I think, but hopefully in the way that I show up. So this is a framework um, by an author and activist, uh, Deepa Ira, who is, um, who is really kind of starting to make us think and really believe that not only are we all connected around this idea of like shared liberation, of equity, of like justice, but we also all need each other and we all can't play the same role, right? So, so what I think about is like, you know, who are the folks that are keeping people alive? Who are the folks that are disrupting this process, right? Like who are the folks that are saying like, I will not, I cannot, um, you know, watch this anymore? Who are the folks that are like the visionaries? And let me just say, every one of these bubbles is filled by, in the queer community, local queer folks. And let me say this again. So the folks who are like, Storytellers are in this room, right? Like that is true and there are queer folks on this team. The disruptors are in this room. I thought I saw Senator Hunley, but maybe not. Um, <laughs> the builders are in this room. The frontline responders are in this room and in this city. There are people building entire whole ass food systems and mutual aid organizations for people in this community in this city. Um, and so I would just like, what I'm inviting you all to do is start to take a look at this and start to say, like, where am I in this space? Um, who, I, who am I in this space, and, and who and how are we kind of connected to one another? Um, and then I would also just say, like, ask yourself the same question that I was saying, which is that like, in this moment and beyond, are we fighting for, are you fighting for freedom, or are you fighting for this idea that like, power and privilege is gonna come if I keep things to myself, right? If I just go and, and, and work really hard and keep that connection or raise that money and don't share it, share your resources, share your networks, share your money, um, with folks that are doing this work, um, then, then to me it, 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 it feels much more like we're, we're fighting for um, power and privilege. What I just want to name really is that what's happening down the street, um, which is the like coordinated attack on the queer community, more specifically the trans and gender nonconforming folks and family in this state, it's also happening at the Thanksgiving table, it's happening in your own homes, it's happening in, in, in spaces where we visit and frequent. And what I would just say is like resist this urge to ignore what's happening right now. I thought there was a clap, so I'll clap that. <laughs> so, so what I also argue is that like ignorance is actually an organizing strategy of the folks who want to dehumanize us, right? Like they want us to say like, hey, we are not at a table here. We're in this hierarchy and we're in this binary and we then need to kind of like fight it out or eat each other to be able to do that. And I just say like resist that idea. Like it's bullshit. You, we need each other. I just showed you an ecosystem. That's a picture and a visual. But in this room, like there are people that are caring for in all the ways each other. Um, and I would just continue to urge you to think about that when you leave this room, um, when you go back to your day jobs, when you go back to your like homes, right? When you go back to the spaces where this kind of false narrative continues to be touted and repeated um, publicly and otherwise. And so I just, I just wanna you know, continue to bring us back to this idea that like, there is this, you know, this is part of the plan. Like this is coordinated. Like if we all are sitting here thinking like, oh, this is just an attack on tr our trans family and our gender non-conforming family, like it's really misguided y'all. Like this is a universal attack on like self-determination. This is a, a universal attack on like us as humans to be able to see ourselves and each other as like people that I can work with, not people that's something that's other than me. Um, and so I, I just wanna say like, this is not gonna stop here and I just want to like call you again and again to ask the question of like the work I'm doing here in this city and beyond, am I fighting for freedom 
of people or am I fighting for power and privilege and in the end, the ability to treat people the way that like women have been treated, folks of color have been treated throughout the years, like that is essentially continuing to perpetuate this kind of idea. And so just continuing to ask yourselves, like what am I fighting for? Like where am I, what am I fighting for? Who am I fighting for? Um, you know, when I think about some of my most creative work, I actually think it is in my relationships and my community building. Um, and that comes from like, you know, designing a hoodie or bringing this many people in a room and this much kind of like talent in a space. And I would just say like, offer that to you all as you think about yourselves as creatives. Like that is, this relationship building is what we need right now, that kind of creative connection. Um, and that bravery to just really say, like, I'm going to interrupt and stop a lot of this lies, a lot of this bullshit that's kind of going on. So if you are going to join us and fill the street of Mass Ave on June 10th, June 10th, um, I really hope you're interrogating, like, where you're at right now in this moment. Where are you spending your money? Where are you spending your time? Who are you caring for? What does that mean and look like to you? Because it's not that you're not welcome, but it's certainly... It, it, I want you to think about, like, what is the role that I'm playing? Because we're not just for your drag brunches. We're not just for your parade in June when you want to say we're kind of like, I have this progressive ideology. Like, we are humans. We are Hoosiers, and we are here. And what's happening is not going to stop, right? It's not. Unless this kind of collective can come together and continue to self-reflect and also start to build coalition around how do we stop and interrupt these ideas. Right? So I want to invite you to kind of do that self-reflection and also to continue to connect with folks in this room and beyond. Um, and, and really just the last thing I'll just say is I, I feel really proud to be a part of an ecosystem um, of the queer community here in Indianapolis. And um, some of that is you know, the folks that were around that, that, uh, that wheel that you had shared. But some of them, um, and, and I should say, and some of them are here in this room and, and beyond. So there's a resource page that we are going to put um, make available to you all on the Creative Morning website. I think we'll share that out to you all later. But they're also here today. And so I just want to shout out like the blood, sweat, and literal tears of the beautiful woman who is screaming there and is sitting here with you graciously this morning, which is Kit Malone. <laughs> um, the ACLU is doing a lot of really, really cool shit, and Kit is doing the, like, very, very good heart work, and um, I just appreciate you and want folks to know and sign up and, um, and, and, and sign up for these kind of, like, newsletters to be able to then write your representatives. I mean, there are actionable ways right now that you can do that, so visit this table here. Um, Indiana Youth Group is doing and going to continue to do the work of protecting queer youth in this city and across the state. Shout out expansion. Um, <laughs> So proud of Shelly and the IYG team here today. There's another organization that we hope to join, but Trinity Haven is doing really, really good work around queer um, homeless youth, so shout them out. Um, so visit these organizations. Like, these folks are here in this city. Again, resist this urge to ignore that there are real-life opportunities when you're like, I don't know how to help. That's not true. There, there are ways to help. I don't want to, <laughs> don't want to put shame or judgment. There are ways to help, and um, and many of those folks are here right now in front of your face. I'll also name Camden. Can you raise your hand? Camden um, Osland is with us. He's an Indie Pride staff member. Shout out Camden. Um, Camden's going to be sharing uh, or selling kind of these hoodies, T-shirts. Um, there's also an online shop. Half of the proceeds will go to Greg directly. Again, pay your artists. Um, so half of that will go to uh, Greg and Hey Kid, and then the other half will go to a really cool queer artist residency that I was talking about that we're hoping to launch later this year. Um, of course, Sylvia and Public Universal Friend. Uh, I will just say, like, we need volunteers. We need volunteers. We need volunteers. Um, and we also need money. So there's two, uh, two QR codes there, again, for this kind of like, what is an actionable way you guys can walk away right now? Um, so, and realizing that kind of there has to be this balance, right, of like, what does like action look like and what does like self-reflection look like um, and interrogating the ways in which we're, we're often perpetuating these systems that are really, really holding people down.